Turn around and grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. I, I, don't sit down. Just grab your Bible. Some of you are saying, well, man, I've been standing up a long time. It's all right. You're going to go home and try to catch up on that hour of sleep that you lost this afternoon. Kick back and take a nap. You can catch up on, you know, all of that later. In fact, right now, just go ahead and just wave your hands all around. Just get some, get some blood circulating. If you're not going to get your blood circulating, everybody do this right here. Because if you don't do this, I'm going to come down and grab your arms and I'm going to wave them for you. <laughs> I, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the narrative. 1 Samuel chapter 24. It's the learning lab that we will be in today. I believe it's a narrative of scripture that God is going to use to speak to our hearts. And so let me say this. Let me welcome you to the first installment of this series called Caves. Several weeks ago, we had a creative meeting. And in this creative meeting, we talked about, okay, how does God want to speak to us in 2018? And we were looking at different messages and sermon series, possibilities, how is God speaking to us? And then we had this thought, let's look at all or many of the cave experiences in the Bible where God showed up in the midst of this cave and the person that was in the cave experienced the voice of God and because they experienced the voice of God, their lives were reshaped. Through the isolation of the cave, God gave them revelation. I think about Moses who hid in the cleft of the rock as the glory of God passed him by. I, I think about Elijah who was at the end of his rope and didn't know what to do, felt like his life was over. And he said, God, I, I need help. And God showed up in the cave and spoke into his spirit with this gentle whisper. The Bible calls a still, small voice think about Lazarus who died who was entombed in this cave and Jesus came along and rolled away the stone and he spoke into the cave and his voice echoed off of the walls and fell upon someone who was dead and brought him back to life then I think about David who experienced the cave and the cave experience in his life seemed to be more personal in nature in that God was trying to show David the character of, of his heart. But then the more that you study the, the life of David, you see that the dysfunction of the cave ultimately gave David the ability to function as king. Mm. So let me take you to the narrative and read some verses to you. And I'll pause and offer some commentary to give us context to what is happening here. But in 1 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, my Bible starts out and it gives a title to this passage of Scripture. It says, David spares Saul's life. David is the future king. Saul is the current king. Saul is trying to kill David. David is on the run, if you will, living in caves, trying to hide just so that he can have his life, if you will. He's lost everything. And what is so ironic, it must be so difficult for David and his destiny because David, the name David means to be loved by many, but yet he finds himself all alone in the cave. It means to be loved by many, but yet he's living in the darkness of a cave by himself. So the Bible says this, it says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. Somebody say a cave was there. Don't read any further. A cave was there. You need to circle that if you can cave was there. You see, just two chapters before, David is in this place called Gath. He's in Gath trying to escape the hands of Saul, and while he's in Gath, there is this adversarial king by the name of Achish, 
Achish finds out that David is in Gath, and he says, isn't this the David that they sing about? Isn't this the David that they made that song that says Saul killed thousands, but David killed tens of thousands? And, and they said, yes, it is. And so Achish said, I'm going to kill him. And so David learned this, and he had this plan that I need to act in Spain. I see kittens. If you have a cat, that doesn't mean you're insane. Don't, 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 don't look. Let me back up. But they're not going to be in heaven, just saying. Anyway, so. <laughs> no emails, no emails. So he acts insane. And so the king at Achish, you know what he says? He says, I'm not going to kill a crazy person. Just let him live in his craze. And so David fled and he went to this place called Agilom, this cave. And the Bible says that while he was at Agilom, other broken people who were discontent joined him there 400 people those 400 people became his soldiers he leaves Agilom and he goes to the place called in Gedi which is where he's at when first Samuel chapter 24 opens up in Gedi is this hillside that overlooks this canyon and there are these series of caves that are at in Gedi and while he sat in Gedi in the brokenness soul wounded in his spirit wounded in his emotions wounded by loss he writes a song the song captures the essence of his brokenness the emotional context of what is happening in first samuel chapter 24 he writes about in psalms chapter 142 in Psalms chapter 142, can, can I read it for you really quick? Can I? J just, just hang on. I just don't be seated yet. But, but let me just read this to you, just this part of it. Because in Psalms chapter 142, I, I, I don't know exactly how David did this. But in the midst of the darkness of the cave, it says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. He said, I cry aloud to the Lord. He cries out to God in the midst of being wounded. Theologians say that there are two things that run parallel in this narrative. One is that David has come to the realization that he is helpless and hopeless when it comes to his own ability. But secondly, and more importantly, the other theme would be that David recognizes that he must have a dependence upon God when he feels helpless. So somehow David gets alone in the cave with 400 men somewhere else, and he writes this song. And, and, and when he begins to write this song, crying out, he lifts up his voice. He all of a sudden hears the voice of the Lord, and he realizes that even though he is wounded, he is not worthless. In fact, somebody look at your neighbor and give to them the title of today's message, Wounded But Not Worthless. Look at somebody else and say, Wounded But Not Worthless. Just, just be seated again. Verse 1 says, again, just keep your finger right here in Psalm 142 for me. Verse 1 says, I cried out to the 400 men who were in the cave with him. No, it doesn't say that. I cried out to my neighbor. It doesn't say that. I cried out and my fingers became energized and I went to social media. No, it says, I cried out to the Lord. There was something about the cry. There was something about David lifting up his voice. Do I have anyone in the house of the Lord today that can lift up their voice to the Savior? Anyone who's willing to shout unto God? He says, he says, I lift up my voice. There is so much more happening here than just an appeal from David for help. This term, I cried out to the Lord, is a Hebrew term. Can, can I teach for a minute? I'm going to sit down right here so that we connect maybe in a little more intimate way. But, but 
I cried out to the Lord is this Hebrew statement that actually is a declaration of allegiance. I cried out to the Lord. It's a declaration of allegiance. Why is that? Because you see, 400 other people had gathered around David. Some of those people were Gentiles. Some of those people were calling out and crying out to another God. Some of those people were putting pressure on David to say, David, your God told you that you would be in the palace, but he's not answering you and you're in the cave. Maybe you ought to cry out to another God. But David refused to cry out to another God. David refused to lift his voice to another God. And the Bible says that I cried out to the Lord why he lifted up his voice why because of this he knew that silent feelings could not suffice in the current set of circumstances so he lifted up his voice and then verse 2 verse 2 it says I pour out before him my complaint before him I tell my troubles as I pour out before him my complaint how many of you are glad that God listens to your complaints But do you know what? The complaint that was happening there was not for informational purposes for God. It was not as if David was telling God something that he did not already know. The complaint was there to relieve the complainer. So in verse 3, look what happens. It says, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watches over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Wow. In other words, David is now letting us know that when he feels all alone, he's come to the realization that he is not all alone. When he feels all alone, he's got confidence that he is not all alone, that God is with him. This is the same hero who struck down Goliath all by himself, but when he finds himself all by himself, he realizes he's not all by himself. Why? He might be wounded, but he is not worthless. Verse 4 gives to us even more contextual information when it comes to his heart. He says, look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge and no one cares for my life. This up and down emotional roller coaster that David's on. He says, I have no one. Look, look, look at it again. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I wish I had time to go into this one verse, this one verse we could spend a week on. Because when he says, no one is at my right hand, it is a legal term. That legal term, what you need to understand about is that if you have a defender, your defender always stands to your right. He's saying, I have no one at my right hand. But then it reminds me of something else because there's so much symbolism here. Because over in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, it says that Jesus has ascended to the Father, has ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Our defender, the one who's at our right hand. Mm. Verse 5, we get another glimpse. He says, I cry to you, Lord, and I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. He says, you're my portion. You see, when he realized that he didn't have anything, it looked like he was losing his inheritance. He lost the throne. He lost the palace. He lost his family. He lost his friends. He realized that the Lord was his portion. The Lord was all that he needed, and he loved God, and God loved him. Verses 6 and 7, it says, listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need rescue me from those who pursue me for they are too strong for me set me free from my prison that i may praise your name then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me set me free from my prison set me free from my prison he cries out set me free from my prison hold on a second because the prison was both a place of physical and emotional confinement for David. But I don't want you to see the cave as a physical place. Because we're not cave dwellers. Or 
are we? This week I thought, how can I illustrate this? So I went to Wikipedia. Google and Wikipedia know a lot. So I thought, let me get the definition of a cave because I think sometimes we, I, I think the, the definition of a cave, everybody in here knows what a cave is, and so it seems as if we know the definition of a cave. But I read some interesting things about a cave. It says a cave is a hollow place in the ground. We could change that last word and say a cave is a hollow place in our hearts, in our spirit. Specifically, a natural underground space large enough for a human to enter. And in this case, in David's life, to live. Caves form naturally by the weathering rock and often extend deep underground. The word cave can also refer to much smaller openings, such as sea caves, rock shelters, and other things. But then there's also a cavern, which is a specific type of cave, naturally formed in soluble rock with the ability to grow. Hold on a second. With the ability to, to grow. Then I begin to think about David. David, at this moment in Psalms chapter 142, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, is in this place called En Gedi. En Gedi is this hillside that overlooks the canyon, if you will. The canyon, if you were standing in the canyon, you could look up and you could see all different entrances to the cave. Most likely, David stayed in a different cave every night because he knew that he was on the run from Saul and he was hoping that he would not be in a place too long for Saul to find him. Therefore, every single night he's in a different place, meaning the cave structure is growing for him. The darkness of the cave, he's in a different cave every single night. I begin to think about that, and I don't know who this is for, but he's underground. He's in the darkness of a cave. Maybe your emotional deficiencies have pushed you underground into the darkness of the cave. Maybe your past has forced you into the becoming a cave dweller. Maybe you, just like David, are depressed and discouraged and confused and you're living in the cave and you thought that you would be living somewhere else and it's forced you to live in darkness. Maybe you're a single mom and you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet, but, but all you are is more discouraged and more confused because you're residing in a place that you didn't know that you would ever reside in and it becomes more dark and more hollow and more lonely. Some of you have been living in that cave for so long that you've gone all Chip and Joanna Gaines on it. It's a fixer-upper. The decor in the cave is all fixed up. You got shiplap on the back wall. <laughs> Some of y'all watch way too much TV. You got all those scented candles there trying to get rid of the stagnant air. All because the enemy has forced you to take up residence in a place that you were not supposed to be in. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You see, the cave has caused you to deny your calling. So you're feeding your insecurities. You're feeding your insecurities, and as you're feeding your insecurities, you're going deeper and deeper and deeper into that hollow place, and it's becoming more dark, and all you can hear is the echo of your voice bouncing off of the walls because you have reduced yourself to a place that God never wanted you to stay. God never wanted you to be in that place, and you're there trying to figure it out, and so therefore, you've gone deeper and deeper in rather than rising up and fulfilling the calling that God has for you. So David writes, set me free from my prison. Set me free from my prison. Because God, I don't think you created me for this place. Set, set me free from my prison. Hold on a second. I began to think about that. Hold on. Isn't there something about his name that says his name will set the captive free? 
Isn't there something about that, that, that in the Bible where it says, where two or three gather in his name, there he shall be in the midst of thee? Isn't there something in the Bible that says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty? Isn't there something in the Bible that God will make a way when there seems to be no way? Isn't there something in the Bible that says Jesus Christ got up on the third day and kicked open the stone? Isn't there something in the Bible that says God can turn the cave into a church meeting? Can I get some help up in this place? Is somebody going to help me preach? Isn't there something? You see, some of us need to live under the presence of God and begin to to speak the name of Jesus over our situation because that name will cause demons to flee. Some of you need to begin to speak to the cave of your insecurities. Speak to the cave of your past. Speak to the cave of your problems. Speak to the cave of your deficiency. Speak to this. Speak to that. Why? Because you might be wounded, but you are not worthless. Some of you, you live in the cave of social media. Oh, no, he didn't. I'll leave on that note. Bye, y'all. God bless you. And then you're sitting there and you're surfing everybody else's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, just cruising along, and you're trying to, feeling like, man, I'm missing something according to, their pictures, I'm missing something. And all of a sudden, she posts something, you know, with her kids, and you're like, oh, no, she ain't going to outdo me. So you take all of your kids, and you say, we get ready to have a good picture. You line up right here. You line up just nice and pretty right here. In fact, here's these three green shirts. I want you to put these green shirts on. I know they're all three different colors, but put these shirts on because it's real close to St. Patty's Day, and I'm going to frame this picture for everybody to see. I'm going to post that. I'm just telling you. Jack Johnny, you better get your butt back over there now. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Click and post it. Ooh. Hoping that someone will post to your wall. You're such an awesome mom. But on the inside, it's like hashtag broken. I don't know who this is for, but some of you are looking for validation from that process when only God can validate you. <laughs> some... Some of you are hoping that someone will post something on your wall that will bring validation to you to make you feel good. Can I tell you something? Why are you hoping that someone else will bring you validation when the people who are posting on your wall, sometimes they don't even like themselves? So David says in verse 5 of Psalms chapter 142, he says, I realize that my validation comes from God. And that's why in verse 7 he says, I cry out to the Lord, set me free from this prison. See, if coming out of the cave means calling upon a Savior. Grab that. Coming out of the cave means calling on a Savior. So let me take you back to the narrative. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Flip back with me. 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel 24. We'll pick it back up in verse 3. But, but think about this with me for a moment. Here is David living in the cave when David thought he would be living in the palace. David is living in a place years before he was anointed to be king. David has cried out to a God because he believes the cave is his prison. David thought he would be on the throne, but just because David is in the cave doesn't mean he will not ascend the throne. There had to be a time in David's life where he was saying nothing good comes out of the cave. Nothing good's going to come out of the cave. Nothing good's going to come out of the cave. Nothing good. Maybe you're saying nothing good's going to come out of the cave of brokenness. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of despair. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of sickness. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of divorce. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of depression. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of fear. Nothing good is going to come out of the cave of anxiety. Can I tell you something? I probably should have saved this. But there was something called Friday where Jesus was on the cross and then he died and they placed him in a tomb and then on the third day, what did he do? He came out of the cave. He kicked open the walls, walked out. The stone was rolled away, and he walked into resurrection. Good Lord. Something good came out of the cave. Verse 
verse 3. Let's pick it back up. So they're at the cave. There was a cave there. Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Verse 4, the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with him as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Hold on a second. Saul just so happens to walk into the cave, one of many on the hillside where David is at. He takes off his robe and he throws it over here in the corner. And he goes over here to relieve himself. I love the Bible. It's about real people. Real scenarios. Living life in real life. Here is Saul using David's house as an outhouse. Here is David creeping up, crawling to the robe, pulls out his knife, cuts off a corner of the robe. Here is Saul over here doing his business. I started to call this message. Cutting corner stinks. <laughs> All the real saved, sanctified people are saying, I can't believe he's even talking about such things from the pulpit. It's in the Bible, y'all. It's in the Bible. Break free. It's in the Bible. <laughs> so here's, here's, here's David over here. He's, let's, let, let me finish reading. Y'all are getting hung up on Saul relieving himself. Let's go. Um, Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Huh. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Grab this. Two different perspectives here. Two different perspectives. Two different perspectives. We're going to be a while, so just make yourself comfortable. Two different perspectives. Here is, here is his soldiers telling him, kill him. This is the counsel they're giving him. Kill him. It's your, it's your chance. Sometimes people give us ungodly counsel. But then sometimes people give us godly counsel and we don't do anything with it. We all want to break free from the cave, but we just don't want the obedience that goes with breaking free from the cave. So here is David in the cave, writing Psalms 142, wanting comfort from God. But before God can bring comfort to him, he's got to confront the issues of his heart that put him in the cave in the first place. Hold on. Hold on a second. Sometimes we come to church and we want God to comfort us. And that's cool because God is a comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit to comfort us. And we want to be comforted. And we hear everything that we need to be comforted. We get everything that we need in order to be comforted. But the problem is many times we take notes. And the notes that we're taking give us the ability to break free from the cave. And while we're taking notes, we forget to take action. So here he is. Think about it. The, the soldiers are telling him one thing. It's two different perspectives. David is in this place where God is using this as an instructional moment in his life. He, he's using this as, as this instructional moment. What, what will David do in, in, in verse 8? You see, because this cave really is a physical manifestation of a deeper wound in David's life. That's what the cave is at this moment. How will David respond? Because it's how David responds to this cave moment that ultimately decides his future. You see, this is a test. And a test is not there to teach you something. A test is there to determine what you already know. 
and he knows he's supposed to be the king. But if he does the wrong thing, he'll never sit on the throne in the kingdom. So in verse 8, look what happens. Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. Verse 8 says this. Verse 8 says, then David went out. Everybody say went out. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul. (laughs) Then David went out of the cave. He went out of the cave. He went out of the cave. God wants us to go out of the cave. He wants us to go out of the cave. But before he could go out of the cave, God had to confront some of the issues that placed him in the cave to begin with. Because the cave, even though he's writing in Psalms 142, God comfort me, set me free. The cave had become a normal place for him. And so he's been living in this cave for so long that it's become normal to him. And so now God wants to deal with what has become normal, which is called the cave, so that he could walk him into what he had for him, which is called the palace. And before he could walk him into the palace, he had to deal with the issues that had caused him to feel even more wounded than he was because he had forgotten about who he was because Samuel had anointed him years before to be king. But now because of the cave experience, he's forgotten the anointing that God had placed upon him in order for him to lead the kingdom. So here he is. You can play, my girl. Go ahead. So here is this moment where, I don't know who this is for, but God wants to deal with what has become normal in your life so that he can walk you into what he has for you. God wants to deal with with the issues that have placed you into the darkness of the game, the things that you've said and done to yourself and those things. Listen, some of you are, 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 have made decisions and you've called those decisions God when they are really disobedience. And, 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 and God wants you to walk, walk into this glorious day that he has for you. And so what you need to say to your neighbor today is, guess what, guys? I'm coming out. David went out. It says David went out. He moved out of the darkness of the cave, and he p- placed his face before before day or before Saul. Now listen, David went out. Some of you need to look at your neighbor and say, "I'm going out." Today's moving out day. I'm coming out of depression. I'm coming. Listen, because if God is in you, then greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. I'm coming out of this difficulty. I'm coming out of my past. I'm coming out of this dysfunction. I'm coming out of this problem. I'm coming out of this despair. I'm coming out because God wants me to walk into his marvelous light. Good Lord have mercy. Why? Because I might be wounded but I am not worthless. So grab this. The cave became the destination where David learned how to be king. Grab that. When we think about David sitting on the hillside years before us, this teenage boy, you know, whittling, taking a slingshot and killing the lion and the bear in preparation for Goliath and all of that stuff is true. Sometimes we preachers preach that that was the preparation for, he was leading the sheep so that he could lead the kingdom. And there is some truth to that. The problem is his brother tells us that it was only a few sheep and he said, you ain't real good at that anyway. The thing that prepared David for his destiny was the cave. Watch this, verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. You got to see this. This is where it gets good. Can I read some? Do you have time for me to read some? Watch this. Verse 8 says, Then David went out of the cave and he called out to Saul, My Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand uh, on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there 
there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion towards you. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs that you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, and I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good that you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he not let him away unharmed? Or does he let him away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way that you've treated me today. I know that you will surely be king, and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me, to the Lord today, before the Lord, that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's name. Watch this, verse 22 says, So David gave his oath to Saul, then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. on a second. David and his men went up to the stronghold. Uh, hold on, flip back to Psalms. Psalms 142 verse 7. Verse 7 says, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. When David gets to this part of the song that he's writing now recalling what's just happened with Saul and Saul leaves and walks over the horizon and now here is David with his men going back to the stronghold it's at that moment David realizes he's not alone you remember he said no one's at my right hand oh yeah God has supplied for your need all along I don't know if you're catching what I'm throwing grab this. In Psalms chapter 142 verse 1, David talks, starts out talking about how low he is. But in verse 7, he begins to talk about how God is going to bring him high. In, in, in verse 1, he begins to talk about how weak he is. But in verse 7, he begins to talk about how strong he is in God. In, in, in verse 1, he begins to talk about what he does not have. But in verse 7, he begins to realize who has him. Is somebody going to help me? In verse 1, he begins to talk about the complaints that he has before God. But in verse 7, he begins to talk about wanting to praise God. In verse 1, he begins to talk about his wounds. But in verse 7, he talks about his worth. Can somebody praise God? God, because he reminds us even though we've been wounded we are not worthless get up on your feet and give God a praise that is due his name yeah. grab this grab this grab this this is good this is good I need you to go over in the New Testament. Keep in mind now, here's David, which means to be well-loved, to be loved by many, living in the darkness of a cave all alone. But David, because of the way he dealt with this, he became so well-loved that he became the most loved, the most beloved king in the history of Israel. What is extremely ironic, I shouldn't say ironic, it's destiny, is that Jesus, if you know anything about the lineage of Jesus, Jesus came from the line of David. David had a kid, and that kid 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 had a kid, and pretty soon here's Jesus. One day Jesus is walking around doing ministry, as he's walking the streets, there was this blind dude by the name of Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He cried out, he lifted his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He called Jesus by his messianic name, son 
of David, which means son of the kingdom. Hold on, it gets better. Blind Bartimaeus was in a cave of darkness, destitute, begging for food. When he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, everybody around him told him to shut up. Go read it. That's what it says. Shut up. Ain't nobody want to hear you. Shut up, boy. Ain't nobody got time for that. Be quiet. Nobody wants to hear you. But the Bible says he cries out, oh, Lord, why? Because the situation that he was in didn't call for silent feelings. It called for him to lift up his voice. So he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. At that moment, Jesus stopped. He said, send for him. Just as soon as he said send for him, the same people who were rebuking him, telling him to shut up, grabbed him up and said, Jesus wants to talk to you. <laughs> so they bring him over to Jesus and Jesus heals him. Hold on a second. David was in a cave. I'm all alone. I have no one to help me. Set me free from the prison. God showed up and set him free. Centuries later, Jesus is walking around. Jesus, the son of David, he heals this blind Bartimaeus who's in a cave of darkness. Everybody's telling him to shut up. Nobody will help him. He's all alone. No one's at his right hand. But Jesus sends for him and says, come on in. At one time, nobody liked David, but then everybody loved him. And at this time, nobody likes Bartimaeus, but now everybody wants what Bartimaeus has. The point that I'm trying to make is you might be wounded, but you are not worthless. And God will bring you out. God will walk you into the destiny that he has for you. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you're, you're wounded maybe, but you're not worthless. Listen, you might be wounded, but you are not worthless because you have great worth in God. And he wants to walk you into his marvelous light. Today there's a cave open. Maybe you find yourself in 